Matthew Wall, who's the director of the Material Solution Network at uh, Chess. Chess is the Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source. Uh, and uh, Dr. Wall where will uh, cover some unique capabilities for bacterial characterization that are available in Cornell due to the presence of chess. Uh, Dr. Wall has his uh, bachelor's in physics from Grinnell College, his PhD in applied physics from Cornell. Then he was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and he's uh, currently a staff scientist at uh, Chess and the director of the Material Solution Network. So, with that, we're uh, happy to have you here, Arthur. Arthur, please uh, go ahead and thank, start your talk. Thank, 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 you. thank you, Nicholas, for the introduction. Um, and uh, and for the invitation to to share information about this resource, um, uh, especially after such a really uh, uh, fantastic um, series of talks about applications, uh, this is shifting gears maybe a little bit to talk about characterization, specifically using X-rays. Um, and I'm I've got the the title of my talk here: the functional materials beamline at chess. And this is going to serve a little bit as an outline, so you know. Uh, uh, where the talk is going to go and how how long you have to before your your, your coffee break. So um, I'm going to start by uh, saying something about what if I can get my uh, there we go something about chess. So what is chess and what is a synchrotron? I'm going to tell uh, tell you some some specific characteristics characteristics of the functional materials beamline at chess, um, which is optimized uh, in many ways for soft matter studies. And then I'm going to give a couple of examples. Of, um, of of two ways to use X-rays to to characterize things, especially from the atomic scale uh, using diffraction microscopy, but also doing uh, looking at in situ processes. Um, so I'm having a little trouble. There we go. So a synchrotron is an X-ray source, and it's a big facility. So the, 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 it works by circulating electrons, charged particles around a large tunnel, very very close to the speed of light. When they go through magnetic structures, they emit very bright, bright and collimated sources of uh, beams of X-rays, um, and those are directed towards Hutchins, where we do experiments. The the, the key takeaway and, and the reason why um, why there's been such a proliferation of these sources around the world is because the beams that they generate are something like uh, typically a million times brighter than what you do with the lab. So, as Nicholas mentioned, uh, Cornell has a synchrotron. It's just across campus. It's shown in the upper left. And the, the main uh, slide portion of the slide here shows uh, a, a view of our new, new facility. So that we just rebuilt this facility a couple of years ago and the FMB beam line is circled there. Uh, and that is about eight meters long to give you a sense of scale. And that's where the facility is located. Well, as I said, this is a, a sort of a new facility because most of that floor that you see there was uh, completely, uh, completely redone just, uh, just uh, two years ago. Okay, so, so FMB is part of something called the Material Solutions Network at Chess, which is an AFRL sponsored uh, program here, um, comprising two beam lines. And uh, the, the, the primary uh, reason for existence is to create a synchrotron source designed to support design manufacturing materials cha challenges facing DOD and industry. Um, and the, the principle, one of the main ways that that mission is served is by having beam time allocation actually controlled by the AF AFRL, permitting a balance between practical materials problems, uh, say acute problems facing DOD or industry and academic research. I'll just point out that, that beam time proposals are actually due in late July. So please reach out if, you're, if you uh, are interested. I'll have a reminder of that later on too. Um, and so I wanna then say just another word about these two different beam lines. I'll mostly be talking about FMB, but it's good to sort of see that the design of these two beam lines are very complementary in the sense that SMB, the other beam line, is, uh, supplies very high energy X-rays, and that's generally used to study thicker, higher density materials, so especially metals. So we do a lot of metals work. And then at the, uh, at the lower energy scale, that's, that's the sweet spot for studying soft matter. So I'll talk mostly about that. And both beam lines have a, a, large, a variety of different techniques both diffraction and real space to, 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 to study materials in different ways. Um, I wanna give some sense before I move on to soft matter of what I mean by acute problems involving higher density materials. And one of the things that MSNC is designed to serve. So 
Uh, so quickly, this is um, <laughs> a view out of a commercial airline window. This is a, 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 an event that happened just in February of this year. Um, the plane landed safely, no one was injured. Um, but uh, but but this is this is this the engine failed just uh, about four minutes after takeoff, and um, and the root cause of that failure is a materials problem. So a, a different view shows that that, that the, the engine is actually missing one fan blade entirely, and another one is cracked. So a big chunk of the motivation behind MSNC is to provide FRL and DoD a way to study those kinds of problems. So that involves you know understanding materials that we already use. Uh, that are already in the field and for instance, used in the fleet. But another big part of MSNC is to uh, help study novel materials, so prop materials serving new, uh, new, new applications. And so um, that of course includes metals too, things like new alloys, but also, um, also things like additive, uh, uh, additive manufacturing um, processes, but also uh, composites. And you can see in just this, this sort of overview, that when you're engineering composites, what you're doing is engineering at a very large uh, number of length scales. So from the molecular and atomic scale up to millimeters or meters. And, and that's, a, that's a major challenge. Um, and so you may probably already know that diffraction is one of the um, most tried and true tools to study matter at the atomic scale. And, and I'll talk a lot about um, uh, small angle scattering, use of small angle scattering and wide angle scattering, so variations of diffraction to get at that information. Many of you will be familiar with this already. Um, that small angle scattering can, can give you information on the molecular scale, so nanometers uh, and wide angle. Those are just different, uh, different names to, to separate looking at atomic scale versus molecular scale things. The problem with both of these uh, the problem, maybe one limitation of the fraction is that it looks at things on this atomic scale. And if at, at the moment that you want to do engineering with, with any real material, you recognize that, especially with something like additive manufacturing, the problems that you need to solve exist at many, at much larger range of length scales. So I'm showing on the right a graph saying, you know, sacks and wax uh, can give you information down below about 100 nanometers, and the typical sacks beam size is about a millimeter, but that means there's a there's a large uh, range of length scales that's kind of missing from access in these X-ray techniques, and so the um, one the way that that we address that is by using a micron-sized uh, X-ray beam to extend the the range of length scales you can access with SACs down to sort of close to a micron. That's good. That gets you the length scales you're missing, but is kind of at the cost of time. And so the second technique we're interested in is doing full field imaging or CT uh, that, that can allow, well, CT is not fast, but for doing radiography, you can do that now at something like 50 Hertz or, or even in some cases much greater. So these combined tools now get you uh, a much larger range of length scales, plus uh, the time scales that you want to study both order and, and, and what, what matter looks like at the atomic and molecular scale, but also study processes. Okay, so what do I, I just want to show now, illustrate what I mean by uh, what, how this um, micron size beam is used to do small angle scattering. The idea is on the lower left, I'm showing a whole series now of diffractograms taken at different uh, portions on a sample. And then you can use any uh, feature of those images to build up an image on the lower right. So that's a way basically to, to, to stitch together information at the atomic and molecular scale that you get from each diffraction image, but then look for variation over much larger scales up to many millimeters. So this has been a, a something of a summary motivation for the design of the functional materials beamline. The target was to be able to uh, look at a large uh, uh, range, many orders of magnitude of length scale, but also to maintain the ability to look at things with fast time scales so we can also study processes. And then finally, to really build in flexibility so that we can you know, we don't have to anticipate precisely what kinds of processes people are interested in studying. And so that's the sort of the third pane over there at the right. And that's, um, that's something that we were very actively engaged with, which is finding, uh, you know, developing new uh, sample environments and, um, and, and capabilities at the level of the sample. Um, and one of the developments there, uh, maybe two in brief, one is that um, 
in part as a result of COVID, we developed remote operations. So, uh, so this has turned out to be very, uh, very fantastic because now um, for just standard operations, say ex situ studies, people can design their own custom sample holder, mail it to us with samples preloaded, and then we can do, uh, we, we, it's very easy to run uh, this kind of diffraction microscopy um, remotely even. Um, and then on the right-hand side, I'm showing a, a custom homemade print, heated print bed with a commercial uh, heated nozzle that we've actually just commissioning this week um, to allow, uh, this is to give an example of a sort of a major piece of equipment that's sitting there at the sample position, uh, displaying the sort of flexibility of the design of the beam line. So you can accommodate this kind of thing at the sample position. Okay, so now I wanna um, illustrate the capability that I've been describing with a pair of very closely related studies. These were actually performed in the sort of maiden voyage of FMB. Uh, the commissioning run was in uh, late 2019. So both experiments were done then. And both were um, uh, based on studies of um, 3D printing of, 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 um, of epoxy uh, carbon com composite materials. And one of the um, innovations going back something like 2014 was the development of inks that could be printed um, at, at room temperature. And the, the, the key ingredient to that innovation was to, um, uh, to, to, to create inks that, could, that displayed sufficient shear thinning so that they could, when, when being flowed through a nozzle, they could flow very readily. Uh, but then when, when, when they're stationary after being printed, they would be solid so they could build up a large, uh, a large um, uh, object. And so, um, so what I'm going to talk about now is a couple of experiments looking on the one hand at the processing. So what's, what's going on um, in the ink as it's being squeezed through this nozzle. And then uh, the second example is using the fraction microscopy that I mentioned to really understand after you've printed the structure, what's going on with uh, different degrees of order within the sample. Okay, so, um, so here I'm showing um, a, a, a real-time uh, X-ray radio radiography being performed on a nozzle that was sitting at the beam line. And this is now a, a, a chopped carbon filled epoxy flowing through a nozzle. And the goal of this study was to really try to understand to quantifiably measure the velocity field inside the nozzle, and then also understand um, some things about how this works. For instance, it turns out that it's not well known um, what mechanisms drive carbon fiber ordering inside these uh, nozzles. And so there's some, some, some basic rheology uh, physics that is kind of unknown, and that was, that was part of the motivation of the study. And so by imaging, say, at, at about 50 hertz, uh, Brendan Kroom, who, who ran this experiment, was able to measure the velocity field uh, inside the nozzle and, um, and then tie that to simulations, rheological simulations of flow, and then try to, try to understand um, ordering of those carbon fibers. One of the things that happened during that run is that we encountered uh, a, an event that he wasn't uh, predicting, but, but that is common in this kind of uh, effort, which is to say, you put a lot of carbon fibers into this epoxy, but the more you put them, like more likely it is it will have a clogging event. And so he captured one during one of the runs and ended up writing actually his first paper on understanding mechanisms behind clogging. So it just, and, and, and that's important because you, what you would like to do if you understood that well enough would be to um, understand also how to increase the percentage or the loading of carbon fiber and epoxy because that ties directly to strength, to material strength. And so, as a result of this study, he was able to make some suggestions about nozzle design, and the next round of studies will be to, to, to use novel nozzles to, to sort of um, mitigate clogging. Okay, so here's an example. I'm using X-ray radiography to understand processing at the sub-second scale, sort of 20 to 50 hertz, um, and I'm doing that just by doing straight imaging, so no diffraction yet, but you can see how powerful that is. The next um, study, a complementary study, was led by Ed Trigg, who is um, also at AFRL. And in this case, we're doing uh, ex situ, so the parts have already been printed of, um, of 3D printed structures, but also with um, uh, uh, um, 
similar materials. So epoxies that have been filled with a rheology modifier into carbon fibers. And part of the motivation for this was um, pretty nifty uh, polarized optical microscopy of these cross-section structures. You can really see some interesting structures and it's clear that they're related to uh, the printing. But the, the, the actual interpretation of these, uh, of these images is not so trivial. And so that was part of the goal. So we had cross-section samples uh, cut from um, samples. So that's kind of indicated schematically in the middle, the upper right samples that look, you can see the log cabin structure there. We took a cross-section from those and then put that in the beam. The idea is now we're, we're, we're rastering the sample around a now micron size X-ray beam, several microns and collecting a series of images at each point. So something like a couple hundred thousand uh, images per sample to build up to build up information over a sort of a few millimeter scale in the course of about two or three hours. And it's important to remind you or to tell you that um, one of the things that we knew we would be sensitive to um, at this scale were the, the, the rheology modifiers. So in order to get this to work at all to 3D print epoxies, what you do is you, uh, it, you, you mix in uh, these, something that will create a shear thinning fluid. So in this case, sort of nano platelets like clay platelets, um, disc shaped things that when they flow, they, 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 the, the, the viscosity of the fluid goes down. So that's also something, these are sort of nanoscopic in scale and that's something we're sensitive to in small angle scattering. So here's a small angle scattering image from that sample and you can immediately see even if you've never done small angle scattering before, that the image has this clear um, uh, asymmetry. It looks kind of like oval shaped, even though that's the scattering. There's real information there, specifically uh, that the, the nature of that oval is telling corresponds to the orientation showed in that schematic of what the what the what the, what what the average orientation of the platelets in that um, part of the sample look like. Okay, so now you you imagine. Um, uh, you can characterize that oval, right? Uh, how um, how eccentric is that oval? Which is a, which is a measure of how uh, the degree of order of orientational order in those platelets, but also what's the angle, and um, and then also what's the total intensity. And all those those three bits of information you can are, are cor correspond to three order parameters you can extract from one diffraction image, and then you can build that into uh, an image. So now. In these images, each pixel in the image corresponds to uh, information, scalar information extracted from one of those diffraction images. And you can see um, that in the, the degree of orientation in the middle plot, you can really see uh, very conspicuously how the, 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 the road structure is manifesting. You can also kind of re retrace how the, the, the sequence of, of loading, et cetera. So you're getting really interesting information there. Um, and then you can also measure the, the, the actual angle of the platelets. Hmm. I'm not sure what just happened. I think you stopped sharing. Uh, I think that was more significant. I think PowerPoint may have uh, pushed out and clicked crap out on my end. I apologize for that. That's not happened. Let me. Uh, Hmm. Okay, yeah, my computer was my, dis my computer had had enough in the head, so let's try it this again. Um, okay, we're back in business here. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, let me go and find where I was. Uh, you know what? Here's a funny thing. This is. Uh, <laughs> Okay, yeah, I landed on, I uh, did not land on the right presentation. So that's interesting.
Okay, I found it. Okay. I think I was here. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll try not to, uh, <laughs> I'll try to, I'll try to speed things up a little bit. Um, I was close to done anyway. So, um, so, so this is ex extracting a different piece of information from those um, SACS maps where the color is now coding the actual angle of the platelets in each in, in, as a function of position uh, in that cross section. And so the, 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 the utility of these data now is that once you know you can access all this rich information, you can really, um, you, can, you, can, you can ask many questions that you couldn't otherwise ask. So first and foremost, it resolves some of the interpretation problems with the polarized optical microscopy and specifically these, these bright features now we know correspond to those boundaries, but also you can sort of say precisely what the degree of orientation is um, at those areas and also uh, across different roads. There particular interest in, in, in the transition between roads because um, that relates to some, um, some, uh, some aspects of performance of the material. And we can also ask specific questions. Now you can say, well, what happens if we start loading this up with carbon fibers and it doesn't change the ordering so much that the carbon fibers in the, in the left-hand image are just showing up as little, little dots. We, can, we also have extensive information about that, but you can see it doesn't really change the overall pattern. And you can also imagine asking, well, what, what if we change the uh, degree of overlap in the print? And that's sort of shown on the right, this showing that now a series of these diffracted, uh, these, these, these microscopy images uh, varying how much overlap there is when the roads were printed on top of one another. Okay, so the summary is uh, that we used um, our, our high speed radiography capability to, to really interrogate the process, uh, what is happening during printing and then to get a richer set of information um, after printing, not in real time, we did this uh, diffraction microscopy technique to really, uh, to really back out then what, what, what's, what's happening in, with, with ordering the sample. Okay, and that's, that's actually the last slide. So I wanna acknowledge our funding source, MSNC is funded by FRL. Um, this, this, uh, the work is, 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 uh, is, is done by a very large team of folks at MSNC were supported very well by um, by by particular uh, people at, at AFRL, and, and especially I want to um, mention uh, Helmar Kerner, who's the who's the um, FMB um, um, lead at AFRL, and Louisa Smeska, who's actually the lead scientist at FMB. If you are interested in finding out more, please just reach out to um, to either of us directly, and we'd be happy to um, we'd be happy to sort of explain a little bit. Um, how that process works for chess and for MSNC. Um, and I think that is all. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Arthur. I don't see any questions in the, from the audience, but I had a question. So you said that uh, uh, beamline uh, time uh, applications are due to July 27th. What, what is the to whom are these uh, deadlines or the, these opportunities open for? So, um, so that's when the uh, that's a formal deadline for um, for getting beam time in the fall when we have a fall run starting in early October. Um, for us, for MSNC, that's actually that. So that's a beam time request that's that's uh, submitted to Chess. For MSNC, that's actually kind of the one of the last steps in the process. So, so before before that happens, before you would submit a proposal, most typically you reach out to me or to Helmar or to Louisa and we start having conversations about um, uh, about your project and specifically, um, you know, how close it is to the the, the scientific mission of FMB. And um, so that might entail asking questions about how close related it is to DOD or to industry. Uh, not always. That's certainly not exclusive. There's certainly um, uh, academic research not tied to DOD that gets performed, but those kind of discussions usually happen uh, before beam time requests are, are, are solicited. Okay, thank you very much, Arthur. I think that provides a great overview of uh, the MSNC facilities of chess. And uh, with that, uh, we are pretty much in time, even 